from MGIC. And what we want to do first is go through some of the value around social media, highlight the opportunities that exist and what can be done in the social space. And then we're going to pass it over to Greg, who's going to talk a little bit more about how to do this as safely as possible, what kind of tools you need to pay attention to, and different aspects around compliance that are important if you are participating as an individual or if you work for a specific lender and you're playing in the social space. I think it's important to highlight that one in five page views in the United States occurs on Facebook. That's 20% of web traffic. And why I like to highlight this is because it's important to understand that in order to glean the value of social media, you need to have a presence there. And so having a presence is step one. The rest of it is how can we do this in a safe way? I think this slide nicely illustrates how things have changed over time. You're looking at 2005, no mobile devices, no smartphones, and fast forward to 2013. And you see this is how everyone is choosing to capture the moments that happen in life and using social media as that vehicle to then push that out to their trusted network of individuals. Lots of times here at MGIC, uh, it comes up, well, what is social media? And so I always position it as social media should not be a direct sales tool, but rather approach it as a relationship and brand building tool. And through that, you're going to see, start to see those indirect sales flow through. In addition to that, we have our customers' expectation that we need to pay attention to. 93% of those customers expect us to have a social media presence, to be there, to be active, to be listening and responding. And are we doing that? Are we meeting and exceeding those expectations? The other aspect that I like about this more than either of these two things is that social media is a very efficient channel. It's a low-cost way to stay top of mind with potential prospects, referral partners, current customers, past customers that you might have. So with a like, a comment, or a share of something that those individuals have pushed out, yourself as an individual or the organization that you work for can stay top of mind, can build those relationships through the social channel. And that's really valuable in helping to bring money in the door. I know I said it's not a direct sales tool, but rather 78% of people that market on social media, not directly selling, but how they are marketing themselves, their personal brand, how they're controlling their digital footprint, this came out from Forbes this year, will outsell their peers on social media. So leveraging the social channel as a selling opportunity through the marketing of who you are, the value you can provide, what you bring to the table is key. In addition to that, just looking at the current demographic, the landscape, now, when I first came to MGIC, we held a focus group. What we did is we brought in a bunch of millennials. We asked them a slew of questions. Now, I know millennial speak has saturated the market for the last five years or so. But what we discovered is that, and I think it transcends all generations, is that where do you start the home buying process? That was one of the key questions we were asking. And the two names that really bubbled to the top was Google Search and Zillow. And so if we focus in on Google Search, for example, having a social media presence, will index with Google search. And so paying attention to the areas within social platforms that you have, the key terms you're choosing to use, can help you be found more frequently by the people who are interested in the services that you provide. In addition to that, knowing that today's consumer is very savvy, they're going to want to do their own research. So they're evaluating whether they want to do business with this specific company, this specific loan originator, and so they're going to go to social media as part of that evaluative process. So again, what type of presence are you putting out there? What does your brand say? What is your digital footprint? And that's what we want to focus on because that's where the real value lies with social media. So before you choose to take any action, it's important to think about a few things. Oftentimes I'll mention no hot button issues. I really like to approach social media as a way to increase business opportunities and growth by creating value, being helpful, helping to solve problems or issues that might occur. And so what we don't want to do is create divides or set up walls or create any animosity. And so no hot button issues, I always say is no religion, no money, no politics. If you avoided all of those topics, you could probably be friends with anybody. And that's really the goal here with social media is we want to create those relationships using the social channel. In addition to that, it's important to understand and think about how might what I'm about to post reflect on the company that I work for. 
This is in part where a social media policy will assist with that. More importantly, how might this bring money in the door? We all know our time is very valuable. So if we can identify those instances, those moments that are a great opportunity to build a relationship that can bring more money in the door, that can provide value to a specific customer that we might have or a borrower or a referral partner, this becomes important to know and be able to take action on. And how is what I'm about to post out reflect on me? Going back to what is my personal brand? And is this reflective of who I want to be represented out in the digital space? So some people may be surprised that I am not a proponent of being on every single social media platform. Rather, I think it's really important to identify who is my target audience that can bring money in the door. And once I've done that, what social platforms are they statistically a part of, hanging out on? And then what kind of content or what type of engagement can I consider doing on these platforms to stay top of mind? So if you take a look at this graphic here on the left, Pinterest, highly female dominated. Does that or should that affect the type of content I choose to push out onto that social channel? The goal here is engagement. Engagement is constituted by a like, a comment, or a share. We all know the more engagement that you get from an algorithm standpoint, the more visibility you're going to glean from that. So we want to make what we choose to post out or how we engage on a social platform highly relevant to that end user. If you go next to that, we have Twitter. It's actually up to 280 characters now. Made the hashtag famous, real time. Facebook, the largest personal social media platform. And so you have currently over 2 billion people coming here every single month. So you hear a lot of people saying, well, is Facebook still really worth it? You can't ignore the fact of the high volume of people that are engaging and using the social platform. So it's worth paying attention to. They acquired Instagram about six years ago, $4 billion. I really like Instagram because I see it as this universal language. Everyone can understand and relate to the emotion conveyed within a visual picture. Whether I can speak the language that you have uh, written below it or whether I understand what you're actually saying, I resonate with that visual picture. Very powerful. Now where Snapchat is, used to be Google+, Snapchat has overtaken them. But if you look at that demographic, 12 to 24-year-olds are the primary users. A bit young for a target market in terms of interested in purchasing homes. So we want to put our efforts where we're going to get the best return. Looking at LinkedIn, the largest professional social media platform. I like to call it your modern day Rolodex. So I think for our purposes, we want to focus in on these two platforms in particular. One is the largest personal social media platform, and one is the largest professional social media platform. And so knowing that and thinking about the lens of which I'm going to look at the social channel through in order to glean more business from it, I think this, is trans this transcends all generations in terms of people don't want to buy from brands or companies. They want to buy from the people that they know and trust. And if we look at the network of people we're connected with, whether it's Facebook or on LinkedIn, we are likely to do business or trust those people and the opinions and information that they're sharing more than somebody who may not be in that network. And that's where I think it's important to pay attention to LinkedIn in particular. A lot of people have a misnomer. Why should I care about LinkedIn if I'm not actively looking for a job? I think it's really easy to understand the value of LinkedIn when we look at what does our profile on LinkedIn look like? What kind of impression are we putting out there? First impressions matter. People are going to make an assumption about you within the first 10 to 20 seconds of meeting you. If I've only spoken with you over the phone and I want to do a refinance or I want to purchase a home, et cetera, something mortgage related, I'm going to think to myself, yeah, the conversation went really well, but I want to do my own evaluative process. And so what I'm going to do is hang up the phone and say, yeah, that guy seemed really intelligent, witty, seems like a nice guy, but I can do business with anybody as a consumer. Why should I do business with him? I'm going to go to LinkedIn, look you up. I look everybody up, and I do that evaluative process. The first thing I'm going to see is how well, how closely we are connected to the degrees of connection. So I could see that, oh, my gosh, this guy is also connected with my friend Jane. I'm going to reach out to Jane because I trust Jane. I'm going to ask her, how well do you know this loan officer? Would you do business with them? Do you trust them? And I'm going to value what Jane has to say more than anything that that potential loan officer had said to me over the phone. 
So we want to work to help reduce doubt once we get people on our profile of LinkedIn and try and build those commonalities, have like-mindedness to, again, reduce doubt and help encourage that business to flow through. So pay attention to that when you're thinking about LinkedIn in terms of am I connecting with past customers that I have? Am I connecting with my referral partners? Because they all have their own separate network of people, and you never really know who's looking for what. But if you have that first or second degree connection, that's going to help bring that business to fruition. In addition to that, Facebook. Looking at the value of Facebook and why should I have a presence here as a company? Why should I have a presence as an individual? And it's really, I think, right here the 18 to 35 year old range, and the average number of friends that that age group has on Facebook. In theory, this could be warm leads. You think about the value of warm leads and people wanting to do business with people that they know and trust. I always like to use the example of, are you going to closings? And if you're going to closings and you have a Facebook page or your own personal profile on Facebook, yeah, the expectation is you snap a picture of the happy homeowner, maybe with the referral partner there that's the real estate agent and you post that out to your page or your profile. That's a basic level of success. But a better way to try and get some of the business from these 18 to 35 year olds, if you're helping someone in that age demographic and you have a good relationship with them, why not ask them to take the picture? And when they post it out, ask them, hey, could you mention my page when you post that out? The value in doing that and having that ask is that if you're on Facebook, you know the biggest things that get engagement which is a like, comment, or a share, is I got married, I had a baby, and I bought a house. And so I said, I'm in that millennial demographics trusted network. I'm friends with this individual. And I see that she's voluntarily posted out about how she just bought a home. I think to myself, well, geez, I trust her. And how the heck did she afford a home? Well, here's exactly who made it happen. And in one click, I can go over to that individual loan originator's page or their personal profile and learn more about who they are. But I already feel more comfortable doing business with them because they're in my trusted network. So that's what we want to try and, and leverage when we are leveraging Facebook as a social media platform. So I think I want to provide a little bit of hope here and let you see that companies just like the one that you might be working for are doing this on a regular basis. Navy Federal Credit Union, one of the largest. Uh, Facebook actually did a case study on how successful their social media campaign they did around highlighting the members that are a part of their organization. And what happened here is simply they chose to highlight their members through video, using the medium of video, asking them to basically submit why they love being a member at Navy Federal. And what happened there is that this gained a lot of additional exposure, so much so that in a six-week period, they were able to say that they acquired $96 million in new business in just six weeks by only using social media as their promotional channel. And to me, it doesn't necessarily surprise me, in particular because you think about the high volume of regular use and the fact that people want to do business with people they know and trust. So if I saw a video out there from somebody that I trust voluntarily saying how much they love working for Navy Federal, I might be more interested in wanting to use them as well as my lending institution. In addition to that, Citizens Bank of Edmond, I think they are very unique and creative in how they leverage the social channel to help build relationships. And again, I see social as the initial touch point. And then how can we work to transition that to the more traditional, like phone or email? And so I always like to focus on community. I think focusing on community, where do you do the most amount of business in a 50 to 75 mile radius, identify that, and then think about ways of which you can build that relationship that you have with other small businesses within that community through the social channel. So what this, comp what this bank chose to do is create um, an event that occurs called Herd on Herd, and it's on Herd Street, and it happens on a regular basis. What they're doing is highlighting local communities, vendors, musicians, et cetera, all within the community that they serve. They're sponsoring it, they're putting it on, they're promoting it. And so everyone knows that the bank is the one doing this, and they leverage social in a really great way by mentioning all these different businesses in different ways, highlighting them through the social channel allowing people that follow the page to get more insight about these actual companies and individuals that live and work in the community that they serve. So thinking about what do I do offline 
that I can use the social channel for to help raise awareness about. Another thing that that same company has done that I think is very smart is you think about co-working spaces and the massive growth that's seen in the last five years. It's skyrocketed. And so what did they do? What they chose to do is they bought up an old building in the downtown area, they remodeled it, so they're supporting the community that they serve, and they made half of the space a co-working space that they lease out to companies and businesses within the community, as well as individuals that want to come there. If you work remote, you can come in, you can lease the space, you can work there. But then the other half of it is branded 100% with uh, the bank, but they use it for lunch and learns for training sessions as a place to host events. And then leveraging the social channel, they promote it not just through the bank over to what they have called the Business Vault 405. There's a back and forth that's occurring there, raising awareness, driving traffic to a different specific page, and helping people realize the value of what's going on in these different businesses and institutions within the community that they serve. I think the point here is that if you're not on the social channel, if you're not participating, having even a presence, you're going to miss out on these opportunities to be a part of a lot of this great value and education that's occurring, again, through the social channel. So then how do we proceed? What is step one, really? And again, as mentioned, it really starts with the social media policy. Greg's going to dive into that a little bit deeper, but at a high level, it's really this idea of you need to illustrate the compliance efforts that are out there. And so most regulators have some sort of a social media policy or digital electronic media policy that they require you to hold on file before you participate on social media. So do you have that? And then what's within that? Well, again, it needs to outline and define action steps for violators, as well as in having the social media policy, this is going to benefit your company by allowing people to feel more comfortable on the do's and don'ts of what they can do if they choose to participate on social media. And this plays into brand advocacy. Some of the excerpts that come from these actual uh, regulators is, again, you need to have proper procedures identified. How are things being archived from a social media standpoint? So you need to have an archive of your post. You need to have a proper procedures in terms of signing off and accountability. That plays into governance structure and streamlining the roles, so knowing that you've paid attention to the roles within the company that serve the social channel. So I think one of the easiest ways to help scale your social media presence at an individual uh, lender, for example, is tapping into brand advocacy. And why is that so important? Well, it's important because every person that works for your company has a network of individuals and people that are connected to them again, through the social channel. Whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook, those are probably the two most predominant. So it's going to help you curate content from across the web and push that information out through those networks that exist. And having brand advocacy is going to help in terms of looking at monitoring tools to help mitigate any sort of risk that might be occurring within current employees for the company, as well as what's being said about the company outside on social media. And we look at amplification, right, amplifying your message points. So you as a company, you're choosing to curate or create original content. Well, you've done that. That's great. That's a good approach from a content marketing standpoint. How do we help expand the visibility of those insights to a broader audience? And it's this idea of, again, tapping into your employee brand advocates, leveraging social media. They feel comfortable doing it because you've illustrated within the policy the do's and don'ts and having them go out and share that information of value to a larger network of people. And in doing so, that helps with thought leadership. So you can approach it a number of different ways, but if you also are blogging as an individual or as a company, and you want to amplify that message of thought leadership to help expand who sees your brand in terms of that thought leadership, that can be valuable. What's nice is all of this is measurable in terms of looking at analytics, and you can see how well social channel might be driving traffic back to your main website. And you can then look deeper at potentially the customer journey if you're including specific parameters in the URL or tracking how many people are clicking through on specific profiles. 
This is helpful in understanding which social platforms drive the most amount of traffic. So then you can pivot and modify accordingly. If you see that Twitter, for example, isn't driving a lot of traffic, maybe you pause that, rethink the strategy, or, or just stop using it altogether. So think about what's the value here in my time being spent. And then lastly, looking at brand awareness. So it all really ties back to the digital footprint from both either the company's perspective or from the individual's perspective. And how can having a social media policy that helps encourage employees to want to share on social, how can we leverage this to increase that visibility? Again, social is the vehicle to help expand this, and we want to do it in a safe way. So the last few slides I want to touch on here have to do with this idea of, again, social media channel, helping to expand the message, helping you to define your brand on the social space, but knowing that pushing a sale through self-promotion can drop customer trust through nearly 50%. So again, indirect sales, and that's what we want to focus on. Looking at the example of Facebook, for example, having that really great customer push it out to their network, them choosing to do the work, is going to be well received than a company or a brand out there simply promoting something that they have of value. So there's lots of studies out there, but one that's more popular is called the golden ratio. What this essentially means is that if you are posting on social media or participating on social media in any way, 30% of what you choose to push out as an individual or a brand should be your own created content. So this is considered owned content in the marketing world, but it's content that you have created. Maybe it's blog posts, maybe it's website pages that highlight how you can assist first-time home buyers or referral partners, right? No matter what it is, it's stuff that you create and own. Now, but 60% of what you're pushing out is actually curated content, meaning it's supporting other people's content that is, exists. So maybe thinking about referral partners if you're an individual loan officer, thinking about with the bank example that we used, they're highlighting other businesses and what they do in the community that we all are a part of. And then only 10% is selling. So 10% is promotional about what you can bring to the table, about what you provide as a specific bank. So you see it's much smaller than the other two percentages, but you're still getting a lot of value in creating or curating content and leveraging the social channel to push it out for that visibility. So with that, I wanted to pass it over to Greg so that he can speak a little bit more about some of the risks that are out there and how you can mitigate those. Greg? Thanks, Ben. Appreciate that. And Ben, great job uh, presenting the case for why you should be on social media and how to be on social media. That was very well done. And uh, with that, you know, Ben's got you all pumped up and excited to get started out there. And before you do that, I just want to go through what the compliance side of being on social media looks like and what you're up against when it comes to the you know, regulator's eyeballs on your posts, et cetera. And that's going to be focused here in these four particular categories of risks. I'm going to start with the regulatory risk and then move on through to the others. Okay. In particular, on the regulatory risks are 34 published print regulations that you're going to need to follow. And you're going to probably recognize many of these. This is just a partial list of those that you're going to have to comply with. The ones that are underlined are the ones that we see that are violated most often. What's important to know here is that the regulators are now showing up to do their typical audits at your offices. But this time, things have changed in the sense that they're walking in with a handful of posts that they've discovered on social media that they believe violates one or more of these particular regulations that are listed here. That's a big shift when it comes to the regulators. They typically have an agenda and they'll eventually get around to the marketing side of things, but now they're, they're leading off with social media posts. This demonstrates how concerned they are with what's being done out there in the social media world. What's also interesting is that a lot of these particular regulations, in fact, I think all of them, were actually written before the internet was even invented. And yet, these are all now being applied to social media posts. So if you're familiar with how to navigate print and media regulations, 
And if you apply those to the social media side of things, you're going to be doing very well. So that's one word of caution. Financial risks. So along with those regulatory issues and discovery of posts that violate any one of those many regulations comes the financial impact for non-compliance. And that's gonna show up in the form of a sanction, a fine uh, or fines, legal fees to defend this, and then loss of revenue. The regulators, when it comes to fines, are not intent on putting people out of business, but they are intent on making your life very painful. So they're expensive. We've already seen a number of examples of fines that have been issued on lenders that weren't paying attention or flat out were not watching what was going on and just had no policies to keep an eye on this and have been issued some pretty substantial fines. I mean, we're talking in the six figures, high six figures. Then there's operational risks. And all of the operational risks that, I, that I'm referring to here are all going to be centered around the gathering of your customers' personal private information. As much as you hear a lot about this today in the media and how we are certainly all about trying to protect the consumer's information, one thing to note is as a loan officer or as a mortgage company, you have no right to privacy. From a regulator's opinion and, sta and standpoint, they are looking at private posts and private pages, as well as public posts and public pages. So there is no right of privacy when it comes to promoting in the mortgage industry on your own personal private pages. And we'll get into that in a little bit. The biggest problem with gathering information outside of your systems, in particular your LOS system, is you're creating inefficiencies in that data collection because there, it's actually occurring outside of your processes. And as a result, you're going to have auditing issues get exposed as a result of doing and collecting information that are outside of your platform. I'll give you a real, a real recent example. We discovered a loan officer had developed his own 1003 app, if you will, and, and actually written an app. He was using that on his phone and was taking that information and data, personal information about borrowers. Problem was, it wasn't connected to the company's LOS, and therefore disclosures weren't going out. The uh, storing of that information in a private manner didn't occur, et cetera. And, the, this, and what made it even worse was that the loan officer felt that his app was so prolific and so good, he decided to sell it to other loan officers at other companies. Now, even more propagating the problem across many different lenders who discovered that this app was out there and was being used, and it wasn't in compliance with their particular system. So you see, this is how social media can get out of control if you don't have containment, you don't have policies and procedures around it by which to manage it. Then you have, lastly, the reputational risks of what goes on in social media. We're all aware of how corporate accounts are vulnerable. They're being hacked every day. In particular, they're looking for private information, but you also have some nefarious people that are posting bogus posts. I mean, this is a hot topic right now in our politics. And in addition to that, we're also seeing inappropriate and posts that were done with poor judgment by employees. So remember Ben's slide at the very beginning about the four do's and what to stay, you know, what, where to focus and what to stay away from. And if you stay focused on those three things that he mentioned, then you're going to be just fine. But unfortunately, with private pages, a lot of people expect that they're private, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, in particular, Facebook and LinkedIn, those are the two of the highest risks when it comes to private pages. And an example of this was a negative comment, for example, that was made during the re-election of President Obama. There was a very derogatory comment that was made about his wife. It was made on a loan officer's private page. No mention of, the, of business whatsoever. It was just her personal opinion that was expressed. The problem is, and this is the, the problem with the internet in general is, that this post got shared and out there beyond the privacy of that individual's page. And then you had savvy people who were really angry by the, about this post, who then did their research and quickly discovered that there was a lender that she worked for. And now this lender got dragged into the conversation, and this lender had to subsequently file uh, a number of responses and apologies, and they had to terminate the loan officer because of the 
dust up that this created for them. And it was a, it was a lot of work on their part to restore their reputation uh, because they were basically dragged into this saying that they're, they're employing racists. And it was you know, clearly not the case. But anyway, you can see how reputational risks can also get destroyed or harmed in social media if you don't have controls in place to prevent that from happening. As Ben said, you know, we, um, we get asked a lot, and I'm sure Ben does too, how do you develop social media compliance policies? And here are the basic steps you need to go through. And this deck will be available, I believe, after this is over with, so you'll have this to refer back to. But we also have some white papers I'm going to show you in just a second that will also walk you through in minutia detail how to do this. But the first thing you've got to do is perform an assessment of your social media. Uh, what's happening out there, who's doing what, what loan officers are more prolific than others, et cetera. And even your company's marketing department, what are they doing out there? This will help you to identify your problems. Uh, this will help you identify who is the most active on social media so that you can keep a closer eye on them. All of this will help you to finalize and define your, what your policy is going to end up being if you don't already have one. Next thing you have to think about is either appointing or hiring somebody to manage your social media content and compliance. From there, that person will probably be the individual that will be responsible to implement social media training. Developing a response and remediation protocol means what do you do when you discover a bad post or one that doesn't follow the rules or the regulations? How do you get it fixed? We'll talk about that as well. And then understanding what tools and vendors are available out there. And then finally, choosing the right vendor. So let's talk about choosing the right vendor for a second. Here's what you want to look for when you're out shopping for somebody to handle this for you. Because, and by the way, you'll notice I'm advocating not doing this yourself. This is really a service that's best handled by experts and people who do this on a full-time basis and know what they're looking for and can guide you and navigate you through the, the murky waters of social media. But uh, ask them, you know, can they perform um, regulatory reviews and audits? And, you know, and that's what, is that what their service is? Does their service provide any type of automation for you so that you don't have to spend a lot of manual hours uh, navigating uh, all of these posts that are, that are discovered? Uh, do they perform audits and monitoring or just one or the other? That's an important distinction. There's only a handful of companies that I'm aware of that do both. In fact, there may only be one or two. And do they have robust reporting? Can you supply information up the chain to either your bank board or your corporation, executive committees, et cetera. Here's some key factors to look for if you're going to write an RFP. These would be some of the questions we would suggest you include in that particular RFP. Do they, do they have a single solution to manage the social media audits and monitoring regulations? And by the way, they're different, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Do they have a flexible configuration? to support your company's unique social media policy and needs. Is remediation functionality built into the tool? And if, if not, how is it handled? How do you go about getting posts something resolved and fixed or removed? Are audit and retention functions built in? In other words, Ben mentioned earlier about the archiving. Uh, that needs to be a, a kind of a basic part of any social media tool out there. Does your tool manage your our, our social, our, excuse me, our loan officer's social media activity? In other words, are they looking at anything and everything that's being done out there, and does the tool manage that in an aggregated fashion for you? And lastly, does the tool that you're contemplating buying do? How do they stay current with changing the ever-changing regulatory requirements? So we can help you with this. In detail, we have written a seven-part white paper series that is very consultative in nature. It's not a marketing pitch for Optimal Blue. It's focused on you know creating those policies, and then it's you know relevant for our, both our clients that we have today as well as people that aren't our clients yet today. The first one, I won't go over every single bullet point on these things, but the very first one is obviously is going to touch on why it's important to even have a social media compliance policy. We hear every day when we're talking to our potential clients, 
as to why they should have a policy, what are the pitfalls, et cetera. And we've had responses all the way from, well, this is going to be pretty simple. We just simply don't allow our loan officers to do any social media posting. And that's well and good. That certainly can be the tack that you take. I think Ben has made the case to not do that, to use social media to uh, help you to uh, further your business, if you will, probably the best way to say it. But, um, you know, we, and all the way from, you know, we just don't allow anybody to do anything, all the way to, well, you know what, we'll deal with it when we get our hands slapped. And that's a pretty common you know, response in the mortgage industry, unfortunately. But I'm here to tell you that the regulators are very, very concerned. This is one of their top five enforcement actions, and it's one that you've got to have in place when they show up on your doorstep inevitably and with that fistful of posts that they want to chat about. And if you've got a policy in place, you're going to be just fine with them. Another big misconception I want to clear up before we go on to the other ones is a lot of people are under the conception that the regulators expect you to catch everything. They do not. In fact, it explicitly says so in their regulatory guidelines. They don't expect you to catch every single post and every single word that's said on the Internet. They do, however, expect you to try to. That's a big distinction and a big difference. And there is no service or vendor out there that's going to help you catch everything. Again, your best effort and trying to catch as much as you can and fix it as you do find it, or fix it if somebody else finds it, that's perfectly fine with a regulator if you have a policy and a program in place. So enough about that. The second webinar, or excuse me, the white page, you can get these in series or you can ask for them all at one time, it's up to you. It's a lot of information to digest. This is why we broke it up into seven pieces. But this one speaks now about your social media compliance staff. You know, who's going to lead it, who's going to administrate it, and what are the obligations of all of these folks in making sure that you're following all the regulations. Third white paper is going to discuss how to select and manage a social media provider. Remember I said there are services out there. Optimal Blue has one. You can engage any one of us to manage your, you know, your social media compliance out there. And this white paper talks about how to what, what's expected, how to pick somebody, and how to make sure that they're looking out for you on every step of the way. The fourth white paper talks about loan officer training. Because once you've established your policies and procedures, you need to implement them with your staff. And you need to explain to them what's expected of them, and more importantly, that you're keeping an eye on them and that you're going to expect them to follow the rules and guidelines, not only as the company has set them, but as the regulators have, and then to fix them if they're discovered to be in violation of the regulations. And this is surprising to a lot of loan officers. They're not aware that people are keeping an eye on them out there, and not, not only just the regulators, but their own company. So you need to make them aware that you, know, you are looking over their shoulder, and you just want to, you're not trying to catch them doing something bad, necessarily. You're trying to keep them from being um, on the bad side of the regulators, if you will. Just help to guide them to do things in a compliant and efficient manner so that their marketing is effective, and it isn't going to be a knee-jerk of post, fix, remediate, and then repost. Monitoring your social media activity. This is what slide, uh, white paper number five talks about. Remember I said there's a difference between auditing and monitoring, and this is probably a good time to talk about the two. Auditing is a look back. So this is where you have a, an opportunity to go back and look at all the posts over a period of time that each loan officer or employee has posted and to get an idea of, you know, this is, was part of your development of your policy. You know, what's being done out there? Where are the violations occurring, et cetera? And that's what an audit will discover for you. And it will help shape your policies and your training going forward. Then you need to monitor, monitor posts on a go-forward basis. So audits look back, monitors look forward. So posts that occur tomorrow and next week, et cetera, uh, all have to be scrutinized to make sure that they're following the, all of the rules and regulations. Uh, I just talked about auditing, so that's what's addressed here in, number, in white paper number six. Again, it's a look back. It's an audit of your individuals, and you need to do this on a regular basis. So a lot of people adopt to do auditing either on a semi-annual or annual basis. So they do it initially and then schedule it uh, to be done again at some point in time in the future. The reason for doing that is primarily to find out if there's anything new that your loan officers or your employees have added to their social media repertoire. 
you'll remember the slide way back in the beginning with Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, Instagram, etc. There's constantly new new social media sites that are coming on. There, the um, opinion of these or the use of these changes over time. And somebody who's not a social media user today may become one in the future. So if you didn't know about that in the last audit, the next or subsequent audit will pick that up so that you now know what to add to your monitoring program and you're covered. So uh, this particular last white paper talks about the reporting side of things and how do you rectify your uh, violations and then how do you report that up to your management to let them know that your strategy is working, your policies are in force, and they're being monitored by either yourself or a third-party company. And then how is future training being set up to handle new issues as they occur? We worked with one of our clients, First Guarantee, to, in response to their telling us how how much they loved Optimal Blue's solution and you know, why it works for them. And they were an excellent case study because, quite frankly, I think we found that most of the companies we've talked to probably have the same problems. And so here's what we saw when we went in and did this you know, case study audit for them. Number one was we discovered, again, this is probably the case with many people that don't use any type of tool and try to do this themselves, that it's an intensive manual effort to try to um, catch everything. It's you know, con constantly uh, disjointed. In other words, it's not um, thorough for every single individual out there. So you're going to get lots of different results, especially if you have multiple people doing this. Their information was being manually documented and put into uh, Excel spreadsheets, um, not the highest and best use of an Excel spreadsheet, but nonetheless, that's how they were trying to manage it. Uh, it was manual, time-consuming internet searches for each and every loan officer every day on every site that they're posting on. You can imagine if you've got lots and lots of loan officers, this is a humongous task and one that's exhausting. And when we talk to a lot of our clients about the automation that can be you know, obtained out there, they're, they're, the sigh of relief is evident. They had a problem with a, being only able to manage a static list of their social media accounts. And it was very, very challenging for them to keep those up and update and current. Remember I said somebody who's not using social media today may start using it tomorrow. You wouldn't know about that because you're keeping this on a manual basis in a static list, and therefore you've got an exposure of a site now that's being used that's not being monitored. Lastly, they were having to remediate posts by going to their native email system to communicate with the loan officers and request that they fix things, et cetera, and then had to uh, wait for a response back from the loan officer that had been done. Then they had to go back out to the Internet to verify that it had been done. Again, you can see this is a labor-intensive project. And if you're going to try to do this uh, alone, uh, on your own, in-house, you will quickly quickly inundate one individual, you will probably have many individuals that will need to do this. It's exhausting. So you definitely want to consider uh, using a solution like ours because all of this, uh, both the monitoring, the remediation, reporting, the audits, et cetera, were all done on one internet platform. And this completely alleviated and eliminated all of these particular issues that they were having above. Um, and they didn't have any more issues with multi-systems uh, syncing with each other and when it came to uh, the remediation of these particular posts out there. So uh, First Guarantee found this you know, to be an incredibly useful tool for them to use. So let me talk a little bit more about our, our solution in particular. Again, we're one of you know, several vendors out there that you can choose from. We'd be flattered and honored if you'd give us a call and let us do a demonstration for you. But let me just give you the highlights of what our system does. One of the biggest things, and this is, a, this is a big one, one of the biggest things about our platform is we already know who all your loan officers are. What I mean by that is anybody else you use, you're going to have to load them yourself. It's going to have to be a manual input or it's going to have to be a data upload, and it's time consuming and it's prone for errors, especially if you're doing manual data input. We already know who all your loan officers are because for the last 10 years, we've been gathering due diligence information on every third-party originator in the country, and with that is the NMLS licensing, and that tells us who the headquarters are, the branches, and all the loan officers. So when you start with us, 
you go to uh, start your order, set up your automation, your loan officers are already there for you. And, and, and we keep track of their coming and going. That's also a big task. And in addition to searching the internet for all their posts, you got to keep track of who's left and who's joined your company. And let's face it, turnover is pretty high in the mortgage industry, especially with loan officers. Uh, we do provide training uh, on how to use the system, so you will um, engage with us if you sign up for to use our platform. You're not left on your own, in other words. And uh, if you've already used Comergence in the past to sign up with or renew your application with one of the many lenders that use the platform, then that means that we already know who you are. We already have your information in the platform. You can start immediately. There is no contract required with Optimal Blue in that case. Contracting with Optimal Blue will get you better pricing. So with that, I'm going to go back to our uh, administrator, Alexis, and we're going to, uh, Ben and I are going to field any questions that uh, have come in. So um, I think I have to hand this back over. All right, anyone, if you guys do have questions, if you can please put it in the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Um, it looks like most of our questions so far have been about how to obtain a recording of this or a, um, a copy of the slide deck. And um, I told them they can either email their MGIC account manager or you can email that email there, sales at optimalblue.com. Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions, though. Well, we have 10 minutes, so if anybody's got <laughs> anything, uh, we can hang out or we can just, I guess, call it. And I always like to say, you know, if you have questions but you're not comfortable asking on a public platform, feel free to reach out to both Greg or I. I'm fastest on LinkedIn. I assume Greg is as well since we all get a lot of emails each day. But definitely reach out. Happy to help you any way that you can, uh, social media related, monitoring related, to really help you be successful in leveraging social uh, for that new business opportunity and doing it right. All right, and I'm going to go back to the slide with your contact information just so everyone has it. Um, looks like one question did come through. Do you monitor the LO's personal Facebook pages? Yes, we do. If you want, let me, can I just take a couple of seconds just to make sure we don't have anybody get alarmed by that answer? We do monitor private pages, both for Facebook and for LinkedIn. It does require the loan officer give us authorization to do that. That's our Facebook and LinkedIn requirement, and that's handled through tokens. And we handle all of that very elegantly through our online social media app where the loan officer can download it to their phone, and this is where they'll associate their accounts and provide that permission. Second to that, what's important to note, if it's a public page, all of your posts are archived on every single loan officer that you have us do a review on. And but not on private pages. Private pages, we do not archive their private content unless it was a post that violated one of the 34 regulations. In that case, any violating posts will be archived. But other than that, we do protect, because we're required to, the privacy of the individual on Facebook and LinkedIn and do not share that information with your employer. All right, awesome. It looks like we have another question that came through. Um, even if your company does not have a strong social media presence or immediate plan to implement and social media, a social media marketing strategy, is it necessary and or a good idea to have policies set in place to protect the organization and employees? Well, the answer is yes, absolutely, it's, it's necessary. Even if, again, your policy is that we don't allow our people to do anything, one thing that I want to point out is a regulator will not accept that answer when it comes to how do you make sure that they're not doing anything. In particular, you can tell somebody you know, not to do it all day long. If you have children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They're going to do it anyway. So this is where you have to have a program in place that keeps an eye on it to make sure that they aren't promoting or saying anything about uh, their position or loan offerings, et cetera, at your company. So merely having a policy that says they don't have, that they can't do anything is not good enough. Unfortunately, you do have to have a program in place to monitor that. Okay, great. And someone asked, can Encompass be integrated with Optimal Blue? <laughs> 
Uh, that well, that's a that's a pretty broad question. So we already have an integration with Alpha, with Encompass, but I think more on the pricing side of things. If you're talking about social media, that's probably not the appropriate place to do it anyway. So this is something that uh, will be done strictly with Op between you and Optimal Blue. All right, awesome. Um, would you recommend having two pages, a personal and a professional page? I, I think, well, yes, and here's why. Uh, personal pages should be for personal posts. That's where you share with your family your pictures and latest activities, it's, you know, upcoming activities or whatever it is you want to do, um, but, you know, on a personal basis. This is where you should stay away from promoting your company or your, what you do for a living or even, you know, soliciting for, for loans, et cetera. And you should have a private, excuse me, a public page for that or a business page for that. Facebook and LinkedIn provide you the ability to have multiple pages where you can have a business and a personal page. So definitely recommend doing that. The danger is sometimes you just forget which one you're on. And if you're on your private page and you accidentally put out a mortgage solicitation and it now violates one of the regulations out there because you forgot to do something or it's not, it's not correct or it doesn't follow your company's guidelines, then you're going to have an issue. So um, it, you got to pay particular attention as to which site you're on. Hey, Greg, and I would just add to that with regard to Facebook specifically, a lot of times um, that question does come up. And a personal profile on Facebook uh, is your personal domain. We always recommend that business page on Facebook. And you can then drive traffic from personal profile over to a business page if you feel it's warranted or if there's something of value there to let people know that are your personal connections. Hey, this might be of interest to me. But again, to, to Greg's point, you know, your personal profile, you don't necessarily want to alienate individuals with what you do day in and day out, but you can use it strategically to help drive that traffic over to your business hub, which is your Facebook business page. Good point. All right, it looks like that's all of the questions that we have. And again, if you do have any questions for Ben or Greg, feel free to reach out to them. Oh, wait, we got another one. <laughs> they okay. keep coming in. Um, Ben talked about promoting community events through social media. Other than proper training for posting on social media, do you see a practice that would be beneficial for creating immediate call to action that would be safe for compliance? Well, I would say when looking at what you want to post on the social channel uh, to help build those relationships, again, I look at community, what's going on, what can I do face-to-face -face that translates well um, to the uh, social channel. So a lot of times lunch and learns come up, make sure that you get verbal permission. Some companies may require that you get an actual written release from anyone that you're featuring on a, on a, pro on a Facebook a business page or even on a personal profile, depending on what your social media policy stipulates. I also like to use the example of think about businesses that you go to on a regular basis. You know, uh, is it a flower shop? Is it a bakery? And you think about the value of working to highlight that specific business. You know, what's worth my time of taking 30 seconds to snap a beautiful picture of a bouquet of flowers, post it out on my personal profile or my business page, more effectively your business page, to say, I always love coming here every Sunday to get these flowers. They always brighten my week. You're using a nice visual and you mention that specific company within your community. And the, and the, the so what to that is, the value prop, is you think about the business owner that sees a bunch of foot traffic you don't know anything about. If they're on Facebook and have a business page and they see that you've been mentioned in a positive light, they're more likely to mention you as an individual or the company that you work for. When people come in that foot traffic and they have problems or they have questions and that business owner is the trust agent. So an example is, you know, looking to sell my home or I need to do a refinance on my house, I need to get a mortgage for my daughter, who do you recommend, right? I trust you as the business owner. If you're top of mind from doing something as simple as mentioning them in a positive way through your business page, you're more likely to get that referral business, digital word of mouth, really. Great. Um, should loan officers team up on Facebook professional pages? 
Well, I would say yes to that. Uh, again, going and defaulting back to what does your social media policy allow for? What am I able to do based on the company that I work for? But a lot of times we talk about the referral partnership. Um, you know, the real estate agent and the loan originator is the easy one to do. Uh, we give examples of that quite a bit when we're speaking on a specific platform on the social channel. Loan officer to loan officer, absolutely too. You know, you team up, you do something fun uh, that that maybe highlights your referral partners or highlights your customers that you work with, uh, things like that. What are you doing face-to-face -face that you can then take to the social channel to help expand visibility about who you are and what you do? All right, thanks, Ben. All right, <laughs> I'm going to tell you again that there's no more questions in here, but we'll see if they pop up. Um, if you guys do have questions for Ben or Greg, feel free to reach out to them directly. Their emails are up there for you. Again, if you want a copy of these slides or a link to the recording, please reach out to your MGIC account manager, account manager or email sales at optimalblue.com. Um, I don't see any more coming in, so I think we'll just wrap it up here. I want to thank both, both of you guys for being here and presenting for us today. Thank you. Much appreciated. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.